I'm really happy to have Jay Smooth here. You have created and hosted the longest running hip hop show in New York, but does that mean really everywhere, right? Probably. Someone will always pop up with some 10 watt station and say otherwise, but New York, definitely. 27 years? How many years? 27 years, 1991. And he's only 37 now, so that's pretty amazing. (laughs) Yes, absolutely. Uh, Also, you produced uh, video, well, you had a hip-hop blog early, you were also early on that. Started one of the first hip-hop blogs at hiphopmusic.com, helped to build that community of hip-hop blogs. And and also, like, writing about it, which was important. Yeah, I mean, I was writing my mentor, one of my mentors in radio, Babito Garcia, connected me to the source in 91. I went on to write for Vibe, XXL, and so on. And then in that blog space later on, got to do a lot of great writing and sharing of ideas. And therefore, sort of, you became a keeper of the culture, too, right? Between the radio show and that. I'm going to call you. I'm going to call you that. You don't have to I'll take that. Put that on. Uh, and then you decided that writing wasn't enough and you really wanted to get your face in front of people. So you got early on the video blogging. I'm just making stuff up. I don't know if that was the thought <laughs> process. But uh, I did around, what, 2006, 2007. Um, you know, when there's a new media space that doesn't really have a strong hip-hop voice yet, I like to try to mm-hmm. get in early. Uh, you know, there's a, I saw Steve Allen talking about the early days of TV once, and he said, if you get in early enough, you're a pioneer by default, no matter how mediocre you are. So I try to, <laughs> so I try, try to plant my flag early. Uh-huh. So pretty early on in the days of video blogging, um, I started trying to explore that and found it was a really rewarding set of creative challenges, all the different elements that have to come together to get the message across. And that's become probably, outside of the radio show, the most rewarding work I've done. And it, I mean, so first of all, you were a pioneer there, but you also... I mean, he's very well... How many of you have seen some of Jay's uh, videos? Several wow. of you. By the end of this, everybody will be able to say that they have. Uh, but, I mean, you have, like, videos that are over a million views that are used in courses all over the country. Um, so it's worth checking out. You definitely should go check out his videos if you haven't. And most of them are relatively short. So, But I also think I, I was sort of uh, playing with you a little bit because... We're both kind of introverted, yes. which should make for an, a compelling conversation up here today. Um, but that idea of like of actually putting your face on the video, like that is a thing, right? Like, I mean, that was not an automatic, I assume, for you. That was a big challenge, you know, just yeah. like you sort of get used to hearing your external voice doing radio, where eventually my external and internal voices sounded the same. It mm-hmm. was a long, difficult process for me getting comfortable looking at myself and being uh, comfortable with how I look, what my gestures are, all these different elements, especially as a radio person and an introvert, that I'm suddenly bombarded with filming it myself and editing myself. Mm -hmm. And it was sort of, you know, as an introvert who grew up really isolated and has had to learn to believe I should be seen and heard, it was, I think that's one of the reasons I started doing it was as a challenge to try to see myself differently and get comfortable with myself in a different way. And that's one of the first things you talked to me about when we first met, and it stood out for me because it is, I mean, I have that same challenge. I'm guessing a few other people in the room also have that same challenge about seeing yourself or seeing your voice. That's why we had a workshop on it this morning. Um, but it's worth it because <laughs> look at, I mean, if you look at everything that you've done, it's really amazing and inspirational. And at the same time, it's a creative process which ha- is fraught with all the things that creative processes are fa- fraught with. Maybe before we get into that, just to update the resume, uh, you um, have also done the Crash Course uh, Media Literacy Series. Did a great series as a YouTube channel named Crash Course, run by the Green Brothers. Um, that cover a lot of different topics, and I hosted their series on media literacy, which and I was really happy with. I'm sorry, I'm jumping all over. And then, the, the, and then in general, I think we can call you a cultural commentator, right? And you'll see Jay pop up in different places on different TV shows. Some of them exceptionally exciting if you're watching them when they go down. I mean, they are exciting in general, but there are, there's a few. Exceptionally awkward. I think no, no, no. Say. Well, that, yeah. <laughs> we, can, we can talk about that too, maybe. But um, so I wanted to go back to the videos and the process of creating the videos and, and also the process of putting yourself out there, both uh, sort of physically because you have your image, like you're looking at yourself, but also you're, you're, everything you're doing has a point of view t- attached to it. And, and then also 
either interpreting or navigating some difficult subjects or tricky subjects, which is also what makes the videos really compelling. So the first video that I was aware of that you did was about the little haters. Has anybody seen that video? We're about to watch it. So do you want to explain what the little hater is? Or maybe it's in the video. You might be able to explain it better than yeah, me. Yeah, then my stalker tendencies come out. I don't go out. back and watch myself Let's, let's watch often. the video first, and then we'll <laughs> talk about it. It's about being blocked creatively. I remember that. Check it. New star, new spirit, new stamina. Same rap, same cat, new camera. Used to rep the hood, now I'm on a better block. And you know I'm serious now, because I'm letterboxed. Ill Doctrine is back in effect. I haven't done a video in a long time. There's been a few reasons for that. Reason number one, somehow both my cameras managed to stop working. Reason number two, I was busy with my first ever trip to Los Angeles for this big web video event called the Winnies. Shout out to everybody I met over there. And the other reason I haven't been doing videos for a while is basically I don't always feel like I'm cut out to do this stuff. I'm sure there are some people who wake up every day feeling confident that the entire world wants to look at their face and listen to them talk, but I'm not one of those people. When I'm in the groove of getting work done and I feel like I'm making a connection with you guys out there and my ideas are resonating with you, it feels natural to keep showing up and maintain that connection. But if I go too long without putting work in and it feels like that connection is broken, there's a little voice inside my head that starts playing tricks on me and trying to convince me that the connection was never really there. And I think this is true for all creative people, that we each have a little hater that lives inside our heads and tries to set up traps for us. And the first trap he sets up for me is always perfectionist. Perfectionist. Perfect. 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 I'm not enunciating it right. Whenever I go a few days without making a video, I start thinking to myself, I need to do something extra special to justify that time away. And then the little hater starts telling me that none of my ideas are good enough to meet that standard. Then I don't want to work and I fall into the second trap, which is procrastination. Procrastination is what they call it when you confuse being busy with being productive. And that's a trap that's really hard to avoid when the work that you're doing involves the internet. Somehow that little hater always manages to convince me that those 25 browser windows I have open are making me productive. And I don't catch on to the trick until about 48 hours have gone by and then I realize I haven't done a video in five days. That makes the perfectionism come back and tell me I need to do something even more extra special. Which means it's twice as impossible to have any ideas that are good enough. So I fall right back into the procrastination trap. Next thing you know, I haven't done a video in like 10 days. So then I'm feeling really stupid and guilty for letting myself fall into these traps and I tell myself I've got to make this stop. But since I'm feeling like a loser who never gets anything done, I can't build up the confidence to feel like I should be talking to you in the first place. So the spiral just keeps on going. Do you see how this works? It's a conspiracy. All those little haters. I'm not saying all this to fish for compliments because deep down where it counts, I know that I do good work and I know that I'm blessed to have a whole bunch of you watching and responding. But I would like to hear from you because I know all of you are creative people too and I bet you face a lot of the same problems. So what I want you to do is either leave a comment or post in your own blog. Tell us what your little hater sounds like and what tricks you use to make sure he doesn't win. My little hater's about to take an L today because I'm uploading this video. But those little haters are always there waiting for you tomorrow. My fellow creative people of the world, we've got to work together on this. It's us against them, people. So when I saw that video, like 2010, and then the video came out before that, I think, but I saw it in 2010, I was like, he's our people. Like, he's, he's giants of people, he gets it. I think there are probably some people in the room that can relate to some parts of that video. A few. The rest of you have all conquered your little haters, right? Yeah. I know better because I know the Q&A that we have every year, always something related to that comes up. But so we finally got you here to talk about this after me stalking you for six <laughs> years or something. But, um, so you've conquered your little hater too? Do you want me to say yes? No, <laughs> I want you, we, we emphasize I was honesty tremendous. here I was, on this stage. <laughs> I was relieved that the video still plays well and also so stressed out <laughs> <laughs> to hear all those things described right while I'm in the midst of them. And sad that I thought 10 days was a long time between videos <laughs> back then. <laughs> but you know, it's definitely for me a chronic lifelong condition that you learn to manage. So, <laughs> Definitely so not something that you can cure. And I, I think I'm, happy about, I'm happiest about that video because it helps others in a way that it doesn't help myself to have said it. <laughs> I definitely still struggle with those well, things. Well, you kind of set your own bar then by... Yeah, but I mean, that, 
that video is itself a great illustration of how ideas that you might not think are good enough and ideas that don't measure up by the metrics you usually use um, can be some of the work that has the most lasting value and resonance. That, that, that's a video that I, I had challenged myself to make a video each day that week or something like that. And this was the, maybe the third day in that week. So I was just trying to find anything to put up. And I usually won't make a video about my creative process because that feels so self-indulgent. But that's one of the videos, even though that has far fewer views than my biggest hits, that's one of the videos that most consistently people will come up to me when they meet me and say, well, thank you so much for the little hater video. Um, so that's, uh, that video has manifested as a reminder of uh, the message I think it was trying to bring, that it's, all, it's worth showing up and sharing something, even when you might not believe it in the moment. Yeah, and I think, um, well, at least in this room, everybody can relate to that feeling. So even that sometimes is enough to push through, right? Like to know that it's not just you that can't figure out how to get past those blocks. I, that's why I try to get myself to share things like that more often because I always find that people, people will identify. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, I think for a lot of us, you know, I've been tremendously blessed to have all sorts of outlets for my expression and validation and fulfillment, getting to share ideas and get good response on them. But there's never, there's never an amount that makes that self-sabotage go away for me. Um, so having, you know, having all those, have, having a talisman, a safeguard, some checks and balances that uh, get you back to that equilibrium as often as you can. You know, I think we can never have too many of those. So what are the kinds of things that are maybe more likely to trip you up now creatively? Are there certain situations or, a, you know, deadlines? I don't know what. Well, it, it depends. Um, I mean, there's, I'm either working for some external entity or I'm just making videos mm -hmm. or making whatever whatever ideas I'm going to share, I'm doing it on my own and there's sort of different ways the little hater will pop up and censor ideas based on whatever the relationship with the work is. And um, I think we'll talk later on about me having recently ended my show and I'm really seeing now that I'm not doing the show every week how much that was a, a once a week space of uh, mo just modeling the practice of showing up. When you do a radio show, there's no room for perfectionism or deciding if an idea is good enough. You have to show up on Friday night at 10 and fill up these two hours of space. Mm -hmm. And that commits you to showing up and it's gonna have to be good enough because <laughs> yeah. there will be two hours of dead air. Um, and I, uh, there's a great documentary about, uh, about graffiti where I think it's Lee Quinones talks about how going into the yard to paint a train forces you to fully commit to your idea mm -hmm. because you have to get this done before some cops show up and chase you away. Mm -hmm. And you have to uh, be at peace with it being ephemeral because it could get washed away before the train comes out in the morning. So I think there's working under those constraints, I think can be really liberating as a creative voice. And radio, I think has been a creative space that was an anchor for me psychologically in the way that uh, meticulously crafting a video mm -hmm. just provides these constant mood swings from great fulfillment to constant anxiety, depending mm -hmm. on if I'm mm -hmm. in or out of the groove. And, um, you, and you also do a lot of public speaking. So you're managing, like you said, working for other people, working for yourself. What, what kinds of things do you do to manage yourself? Ah, I wish I was figuring that out. <laughs> well, I mean, that's, out. that's a crossroads I'm at right now in terms of wanting to build creative outlets for myself that also provide community. Um, because that's, I mean, that, that's a need that I have in order to keep myself centered because I, I grew up um, in a family environment where profound forms of imposter syndrome were modeled for me as a way to relate to yourself. Uh, my father was, is, I mean, he's still around. Um, but back when I was growing up, he was a great, brilliant, kind, caring man. He was a poet um, who worked with Guylan Kane, one of the original last poets. I'm gonna, I know we're not supposed to name drop. No, I'm, no, gonna, you I'm gonna name drop for my You're dad. You're allowed to name drop. Um, and he also worked at a school where he mentored a lot of students of color, one of whom went on to be a great poet, uh, Willie Perdomo. 
And he uh, also was mentor to an amazing poet named Sekou Sundiata, who passed on. Um, if you listen to Sekou's album on Ani DeFranco's label, he has a song named after my dad, Ed Randolph, on the album. Um, but my dad also uh, had a lot of demons, um, depression, mental illness, addiction. So what I had modeled for me growing up with him was maintaining this public face that had a really rich relationship with the world, but uh, coming home and having this uh, secret shame and self-loathing relationship with yourself, which is the real you, that every time you go back out there to inhabit that space that you have out in the world, you're taking another chance that they're gonna figure out this is really who you are. Um, you know, there's an amazing Gil Scott Heron song, Home is Where the Hatred Is, um, which speaks to exactly what I knew, and of course I knew all along growing up that wasn't healthy, but that's still what is modeled for me, and it's been a lifetime of unlearning that, um, which this blessing of doing all this incredible public work has been a big part of my process of unlearning that. But it's something that'll always, my equilibrium will always naturally shift towards not believing that I ought to show up, so as many external mm -hmm. markers I can have to bring me back towards showing up are, are really important for me. So I'm looking right now for the next, next ways I can sort of create the world that I want to live in creatively and have people around me that reinforce that. That's, um, that's great. Because and my dad, by the way, is in recovery now and doing really well, <laughs> performing yeah. again. I, we, this, that conversation of imposter syndrome comes up every year at Giant Steps in one way or another. So I, it is that was one of the sort of hooks about having you come in here is to talk about that. Because uh, for different reasons, we all face it at different times. And um, I think that is, for me at least, learning from each other and also helping each other out from time to time. Uh, like Mooks talked about the second voice this morning for a couple of different things, that also applies. Um, and then I imagine putting your, and a lot of your videos are political, I think we can say that. Uh, the video that you did the day after the 2016 election I think impacted a lot of people. Even a few people in this room have mentioned it to me and in terms of something that they needed to see or hear. Um, but obviously when you put yourself out in that realm or talking about music and hip hop, uh, there's probably some uh, external criticism that comes along with that. <laughs> How do you deal with that, with the people who are weighing in uh, with critiques of what you're saying, or just, you know? I think over time, having the blessing of a lot of great positive feedback from like-minded people and kindred spirits, um, and also having the, well, I won't say blessing, the privilege as, a, you know, cisgender, heterosexual man of, I can have a voice on the internet that is outspoken on issues and get one one hundredth of the backlash um, that other marginalized groups are going to get. I mean, being a woman on Twitter saying the exact same things I say would give you a far different relationship with the rest of Twitter than what I'm going to get. Um, so I am more easily than I think many other people um, able to ignore sort of negative feedback, even when this a certain pretty well-known troll sent all his followers after me. And it, but if it's, as long as it doesn't uh, cross the line into straight up abuse and harassment, which it generally hasn't for me, knowing that you are diametrically opposed to me and your principles means that you're supposed to be offended and angry by what, you're not supposed to like what I say. So that's confirmation that I'm on the right track if you, if you are triggered in this fashion. Um, so, I mean, that feedback that will uh, trouble me or stress me is when I feel like someone is listening or receiving it in good faith and is receiving it a in a different way than I intended mm -hmm. or I hoped. Like that, that sort of thing will stress me out. And then how do you, I mean. And I do also, I always want to be fair, I'm usually going at somebody in some form, I'm critiquing somebody, and I always want to be fair to that person in the critique, make it about whatever it is I'm critiquing and not them as a person. You know, it, one of the things I had to learn over the 10 plus years of making videos is resist the temptation to get a laugh by talking about some other characteristic that's not related to 
um, whatever they've done wrong, in my opinion. You know, as I early on did a, a video about Don Imus when he had whatever was the racist, oh, yeah. the particular racist thing he had said on that occasion, and he was in the news. I made a video about that where I sort of cracked some jokes about him being old and senile, and I had to receive some pushback from my viewers to really consider that that's, that doesn't add anything to my argument. It's a cheap joke where I felt from the rhythm of the video I needed a joke, and it's not really what I want to model for how I'm going to relate to other human beings. So that's a lesson I had to learn a few times of don't go for the joke just because it's there. Right. So that, that's interesting. And that goes back to, there's another Little Hater video that was the follow-up to this several years later. I don't We're not going to show either. it this time. Okay. But it, uh, I think it was Haters, They Multiply. I can't remember what it was. Oh, yeah, I, re I remember that being the name of it. But it was uh, that, the fact that you had two now, which was that balance between trying to do things that are entertaining and then two, trying to do things that are nuanced and right. accurate. And, and, and because you're usually working with thorny subjects, that... That's not an insignificant thing to do that right. So how, how about that? How, how are you balancing that? Yeah, I mean, there's always a compromise between being thorough on a substantive level and keeping it engaging and making it an effective media product. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I think people's patience with watching more long form talking has expanded. When mm -hmm. I was do starting making videos 10 years ago, three minutes was pushing it. Um, now, partly due to YouTube's algorithms, focusing on minutes watched and forcing everyone to make these bloated long videos, I think people's, people have expanded their attention spans to absorb longer uh, pieces of work, which has help facilitate all of these really popular alt-right YouTube voices, unfortunately. Okay. But um, back when I was starting out, you really had to keep things short and concise. Um, and it's ebbed and flowed in different directions over the years. There's, you have a feedback loop of some videos get this much response, some video videos get much less response, and it's very difficult not to be influenced by those short-term results and keep going back to the well of what got more views. Um, but I've learned more and more over the years that making something that I believe has integrity and that I'll be proud of if I see five years later has more, more lasting value for me than something that'll get more views in the next 48 hours. Mm -hmm. But when I see it six months later, I'll say, uh. <laughs> Well, I think that that, I mean, from talking to folks too, that's another thread is, you know, how do you know that you're doing a good job? And it is easy to default to those numbers, right? Like in your case, yeah, views. Yes, so much. I mean, I don't want to like <laughs> go for this sort of pat demonization yeah. of social media. I think it's been tremendously rewarding in so many ways. It's expanded the number of seats at the table and voices in the dialogue in ways that I think still far outweigh whatever psychological hangups the tools are giving us, but the way that all these systems are set up to make us constantly press buttons that all really say validate me and, and tabulate how our validation is being quantified on each of these platforms, I think, I think it has, has a big effect on how, how we inhabit ourselves, how we communicate with each other. Well, and I think also, I mean, analogous to that in, in this like capitalist world that we live in is also your dollars, right? Like, so I know when I started working for myself, it was really hard not to look at how much money did I make this year as an indication of whether I was doing the right thing or whether I was successful in terms of, I mean, knowing that I made a decision not for the money, but still it was hard to take that out of my, you know, or not put that at the yeah, center of my thought so, process. It's so difficult. And I, I got to see this in stark relief by this sort of fluke of one of the platforms. When they started Google+, Plus. some programmer at Google+, Plus was into my videos, I guess, and they made me one of the uh, recommended follows, which resulted in me having about two million followers on Google+, Plus, um, which translated into nothing, because <laughs> nobody used Google+. Plus. <laughs> but it was still really hard psychologically to let go, wow, two million how do I use this to build? There was nothing to build. I would post and get <laughs> no traction on anything because nobody was using it. But it would be very difficult, like at 
when I would work for other nonprofits and other media places, that would be the first thing they latched onto. So, you've got all this, this audience base of two million people on Google, I'd try to explain no. It's actually a meaningless number, <laughs> but people are so attached to believing that that tells you someone's self-worth that they, my friend Anil Dash had the same experience on Twitter of being recommended and getting some half a million followers and having to constantly explain to everyone that he encounters, no, that's not, it's not my actual self-worth in the world, it's an arbitrary number. But I think in smaller ways, we're all being trained to look at, look at someone else's page and say, oh, you have that many followers? Okay, you don't count. Yeah. Yeah, and, it, and it's also, I, well, I have a rant too, but it's a proxy for some of those folks who are working for the companies that want to engage you that it's a lot easier to look at numbers of followers than it is to understand what your actual influence is, right? So it helps them justify and make their decisions to whoever they have to justify it to, uh, whether or not it is uh, really what they're thinking it is, right? Yeah, I mean, there's, there are ways to build broad, shallow connections online, and there are ways to build deep connections with a smaller number of people that you're able to reach in a deeper way. And it, take, it takes discipline to stay focused on aspiring to make those deeper connections. So I'm going to embarrass you a little bit, but uh, at more. <laughs> so first of all, if you're not following Jay on Facebook, that is a highly recommended follow. I think you really curate conversations well on your page. And uh, it's easier to see there the nuance that he uses in these conversations and the ways that you navigate them than for me to just sit here and tell you and them, how you're great you are at navigating them. Threads? No, I'm definitely <laughs> okay. not going to do that. Uh, but so that's one place to engage, and it's obviously, and it's a their conversation. So it's not just you saying stuff. People really weigh in, and and in a very civilized way too, which is nice to see. Um, and so then, and then the videos too. You can see that I think um, being able to see you in different arenas because you are visible in different places and different different areas of public conversation. It is a common thread and another reason why you're here is because you have this kind of uh, presence or wisdom that you, you can tell that you think about what you say and how it's gonna land and how to articulate, like you understand the power of that and then that translates into what you do. And I think, I mean, that would be something that we could all like, you know, it's just, what can I learn from it? <laughs> but we can all learn from, well, how did you get, like, how did you cultivate that? in yourself. How do you wait? How did I cultivate the ability to to be sort of thoughtful and measured as opposed to reactionary or have, you know, cuz I imagine you also have reactions to things that you see. Yes. Uh, but you are extremely I mean, I think that's one of the blessings of introversion, definitely. <laughs> um, you know, I definitely I grew up uh, socially isolated far beyond what was healthy. Um, due to the circumstances I was in growing up, but also naturally having an introvert's temperament as well, which leads you to observe other people's communications and interactions, other people's modes of communication, how they react and interact on all these different levels, um, and encourages you to think before you speak um, and just be in the habit of having thought about what you want to contribute to a conversation or to a given space. And I think um, acquiring a public voice before we all shared this online life, being a part of New York's hip hop scene in the early 90s, that was still a time when hip hop was, at least on an underground level, an in-person community experience to the point where uh, there was a very good chance that whoever I talked about on my radio show, I might go out and meet in the world, um, which I learned uh, from a particular experience where I played a, uh, a concert performance of uh, Boogie Down Productions where they were in Japan and they weren't really giving their full effort <laughs> for the Japanese. I don't know if they were assuming they could slack because of a language barrier, but they were kind of just uh, goofing around. So when we... Uh, when we cut the tape off, I did something I would never do now, which is my co-host and I started, started ragging on the performance. And uh, you might guess where the story's going. A week later, we're at the Apollo, and uh, Karis, one's brother, Kenny Parker, comes up to us backstage uh, with Willie D, another member of the crew, and says, uh, hey, you're, 
hey, this is Jay Smooth. He's that guy we were listening to last week. And I said, well, I'm going to die backstage <laughs> at the Apollo. And then they both started laughing and said, yeah, you were right. We were terrible at that show. But it taught me that you, know, you should never, everyone you talk about with your public voice is a real person. Mm-hmm. And you shouldn't, you shouldn't say anything that you wouldn't uh, say backstage to Kenny Parker at the Apollo. So I think that's, that's a lesson that I think now that we all automatically have this public voice that we use at great distance from each other, I think it it can take a lot longer to learn that. Right. So I'm going to segue a little. So that, I mean, a little bit that thing about the constant battle, internal battle uh, for the creativity and keeping in that process is kind of connected to the conversation we had this morning about grit and tenacity, and it's tenacity against yourself. we also wanted to have you here to talk about the guts part of that, the having guts and courage. And you just talked about um, now in this online world and things. I mean, I there are a couple of things I've watched play out real time. One was your MSNBC appearance, and the other one uh, was this this summer in July was the the. I mean, eventually it became the end of your radio show, right? Yeah. Um, which was crazy, and, and also kind of, I mean, there's one part of that, which is just the crazy that it happens in public that way. Um, do you want to set up what happened? Uh, you had a show. You are working for WBAI that was a community radio station. You've been there for 27 years. An institution years. I'm tremendously proud of having been a part of all those years, part of the Pacifica Network. Great tradition of progressive community radio, um, which I... Listened to my whole childhood growing up. I grew up in a WBAI family. Um, Got an internship there when I was 16, uh, working with a great radio mentor, Anthony Sloan, who was uh, helping produce the evening news with a great reporter named Amy Goodman um, that I got to work with from the age of 16. Got to start my radio show my senior year of high school in 1991 and just uh, got to find my voice and my place in the world through this amazing institution with all these committed activists, organizers, artists, you know, all this incredible specialized wisdom I got to absorb hanging out in this real community space. It was real community radio when I came there. Um, but I guess we're working our way into telling the whole story, I guess. Um, over the past 27 years, uh, WBAI has struggled to maintain its place in the world as the media landscape has changed and we were caught up in our factional strife and hippie dysfunction. Um, And I don't want to get too much into the weeds because it'll be explaining 27 years of a soap opera, um, which is not, I watched all my children every day, I'm not downing soap operas, but um, uh, we lost our listenership and lost our voice and focus more and more over the last 27 years, um, which in a lot of ways has prevented us from fully upholding the principles that we were founded to uphold and taking more and more desperate measures to maintain listenership and fundraising has manifested in a lot of ways that I won't get into. But it all came to a head, um, you know, and a lot of us Producers were increasingly disillusioned for a long time, but holding out because we've all built a tradition and a community there. But what became the last straw for me was over the summer, um, a radio veteran who started at WBAI and then moved to WNYC named Leonard Lopate was uh, fired from WNYC. WNYC is the public radio. The NPR station in New York. Um, Was one of, in the aftermath of the abuse that was revealed um, in John Hockenberry's work at WNYC. Uh, Two other producers, Jonathan Schwartz and Leonard Lope, were fired from WNYC for their mistreatment of women um, in that workplace, um, which made Leonard Lope a free agent, and the role WBAI decided they wanted to play in that narrative is hiring Leonard Lope uh, right after he had gotten fired for creating a hostile work environment for women. Who presumably Um, they thought had a following that was still loyal to him. That was their calculation, and I directly confronted management about this choice, which I was very unhappy with, and they pretty transparently explained it. Um, First of all, 
they do not take uh, the issues at hand in the Me Too movement seriously. It was a really di disappointing, I don't know if it's a generational divide, but they were, they were having uh, all of the sort of stock excuses, minimizing the seriousness of it, we, claiming to know secret details that make it not as bad as it sounds, just uh, everything from the playbook of minimizing this sort of thing. And they were also quite transparent about it being a market-based decision. You know, we, we believe that we are going to bring in money by bringing in Leonard Lopate, um, so we're gonna take whatever comes with that. Um, the station manager literally said to me, um, it's a six month contract. If we don't earn money from this, I deserve to get fired. Um, so I didn't walk away from that conversation confident <laughs> that the station would ever change their heart about this decision that I felt. And there was no concern about what having him in the station might be for other employees? Not at all, not at all. So it was really deeply disheartening. And just this, this moment is everything that I've always thought WBAI was supposed to be a part of in the exact opposite direction. Um, this is just a crossroads of completely betraying the principles that I thought we were here to represent this whole time. And we work free of charge. Mm -hmm. There are no producers who get paid at WBAI. We show up in this building that does not even have a real studio. We broadcast, I'm still saying we, I'll probably always say we, we broadcast not not only is it not an actual studio, we're broadcasting out of a room where the walls don't go up to the ceiling. That's how, that's how much of a grassroots Millennium Falcon barely flying <laughs> organization this is, down to a tiny fraction of the listenership we had even 20 years ago when I started. We have all kept coming back, giving our heart and soul to this institution, free of charge, because we believed in what this represented. If we're going to give that away for the promise of some quick income over the next six months, and we as producers are the ones who will have to go on air and fundraise, say, hey, man, peace and justice, free speech radio. Meanwhile, we're banned from discussing Lopez hiring on air on free speech radio. I cannot go on air and fundraise under those circumstances where everything that I say will be a lie when I tell you to give to this institution. So it just, it put me at a crossroads where I had to make a painful decision to end my show after uh, 27 years, um, which played out in a really ugly way. We had a, I had a really strange interaction on Twitter with WBAI's official Twitter account. Um, yeah, I mean, that was, that was another part of it, was that public interaction. Yeah, I don't, yeah, I don't even want to get into that. No. But, yeah, Although that is what got picked up by a lot of media sources. It became a, they, another lesson is the articles were written from the tweets, right? Yeah, so I, I really wanted to give them a chance to rise to the occasion, so I voiced my objection on Twitter um, without coming out and saying I'm gonna quit, although I felt like it was probably a fait accompli. So their response from the WBI Twitter account was this sort of uh, snide, hey, Jay Smooth, we hardly ever see you in management's office. Maybe you should be focused on getting more BAI buddies, which is the little fundraising deal that we give where you give $5 a month. Um, which to, to me was like as how a junior high schooler would respond to this sort of thing and you take away their Twitter account. That, that, that this would be what, man, and management directly runs this account. Um, this would be their response which I never claimed at any point that I'm some essential fundraiser for the radio station. I am making a claim to the integrity and principles that we're supposed to represent as an institution. It has nothing to do with whether I'm your cash cow or not. <laughs> so that they admit that, that I speak on behalf of our integrity and you immediately jump to how much money I'm making for you. Beyond the pettiness of the tweet, I thought told the whole story. Um, so after that, I announced on Twitter, which wasn't my plan, that I was ending the radio show, and it became a bit of a news story after that. You know? And then a couple of the other long-term shows also followed soon. And something I definitely didn't expect was uh, three other long-running shows all uh, left in solidarity with me, including another hip-hop show uh, run by the Rebel Diaz Collective, a really great crew um, in New York, who 
WBAI's plan was to replace me with Rebel Diaz and put them in my time slot. <laughs> Unfortunately for them, <laughs> they were underestimating the integrity some of the rest of us have. Um, so it was really good. And I didn't reach out to anyone and encourage them to leave. So it was really gratifying to see um, a few other people step up and step away. I mean, when I was watching, I had two reactions watching that. One is like as a woman and, and with all of the things connected to Me Too that have come out. And also, uh, you know Tarana Burke and you've done a great job of, you have a great interview with her also on, online um, talking about her perspective on the Me Too movement and, and work. Um, so, so first of all, that was in line with everything that I knew about you before that. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm just mostly embarrassing you today. <laughs> um, but also this idea that I think we all have grappled with at different times about, we, I mean, probably if you're here, you're somebody who's trying to live in a certain kind of integrity around certain kinds of values. And there are times when your work can butt up against that. And, and then some of us agonize over how to navigate through that. And sometimes it goes okay and sometimes it doesn't. But watching you do that also is informative, I think, for some of the rest of us to see somebody do that, like this can work and it's not easy, there are consequences, there's, I mean, I can't imagine that you, something you've been building for 27 years to put it, like how did you deal with the personal part of that of like saying, okay, now that's, I don't even know if over is the right word, but that, that chapter at least is over. How, how's that been? I mean, that's something I'm definitely still, I think, just beginning to discover. I mean, this has been an anchor, a foundation in my life and a foundation in my identity since I was 18 years old, and I'm not 18 now. <laughs> um, and yeah, I think I'm only just beginning to process it. Um, also because in the immediate aftermath, I didn't want to have a lot of conversation centered around myself mm -hmm. because I felt like the issue at hand was this decision by WBAI contributing to a trend throughout media and throughout public radio and throughout society of women being mistreated, not having equal rights in the workplace, not being safe to work. Um, so I didn't want to come right from this into, wow, this is really hard for me. Yeah, yeah. I'm a man who has been blessed to have a 27-year radio show, and we'll find, so, you know, I've had a good long run, and we're, the world is full of men who have had good long runs. I didn't want the conversation to be focused on that. And people are, media outlets are very eager to make a story out of a man doing something in solidarity with women's movements to a degree that easily outshines the work that women have been doing mm -hmm. forever in those same movements, which, you know, I, mean, I felt like it was important and good that people saw value in me taking that stand, but I felt like it was, as media offers kept coming in, it felt like uh, it didn't feel right to take advantage of this situation where uh, women have been doing this work forever, and that's, uh, that's a dog bites man story, but if, like, if, if a man does, steps up one time, that's like a man bites patriarchy story. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> So I didn't, so I, I haven't really, I think this will be the first time I've really publicly talked mm -hmm. about how leaving has affected me. Um, and it's, it's also, we, we would get preempted often for fundraising. So being away for a month was not that unusual. Now that it's been a couple of months, I'm really starting to see how much, uh, even though it wasn't the focus of my professional work, my online work has a lot more reach than my radio show the last 10 or 15 years, but that, that tradition, that, that, that anchor, that hub of community for the underground hip hop scene, this family that I have built around showing up and doing the show every week, I'm really just starting to see now what a big part of my, uh, what a big part of my life, what a center, uh, uh, an anchor it is. You know, I'm in seeing how unmoored, mm -hmm. sort of lost I feel, not having that there. Like what is, there's so many little ways that it changes what my projection of my identity is how I, in the most literal way, how I identify myself to people. Like, what do I say? I do radio now. Mm -hmm. My name on every website on the internet is Jay Smooth995 because WBAI is 99.5. Do I change that now? Yeah. Do I keep that? So there's so many. It's sort of. I hope and want to believe. I mean, I believe that it'll be 
a new beginning that'll lead to better things. You know, I, I have been able to build this family and this tradition and do all this work that I'm proud of uh, within this house, mm -hmm. but that's not, uh, WBAI, I have thought of WBAI as my family, but especially having my friends leave in solidarity has shown me that uh, you shouldn't confuse your family with the house your family lives in. We've mm -hmm. moved out of that house. That's good. And now we're gonna be free. <laughs> I think it's gonna free us up to continue that tradition to make our home and build mm -hmm. our family outside of that house that we had outgrown. But I'm still in that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm in that zone waiting for the space to get filled. Well, and I really appreciate you coming and talk to, talking to us when you are in that zone and it's not all figured out and crystal clear and you don't have the like soundbite version ready to go because I think that is part of what we try to do here too is, is there's, we know that it's not all cut and dried, easy stuff, and that helps all of us. I mean, I met TK and Conscious at your radio show, so that is even a little bit of, like, I get to be a little bit of that community, but it's been a benefit for me outside of the show. Um, I also think you might have a sense about the nuanced approach that Jay takes to different tricky subjects, so hopefully that will encourage you to dig in a little bit deeper. Let's open it up for questions. Anybody have any questions for Jay? Uh, we should have a mic for you someplace. Only because if you don't speak on the mic, we won't get it in the audio. <laughs> yeah, it's right in the middle. Um, so I really appreciate the video that we saw about the little hater. Um, I'm over here breathing hard as hell. My chest is beating in my heart, like uh -oh. my chest, or my heart is beating in my chest really hard. And I don't know why I'm like this nervous just to ask a question, I'm sitting down. Anyway, so, um, <laughs> but I really appreciate that because a lot of times when I get in spaces like this, um, or just in a lot recently, I've been dealing a lot with imposter syndrome and just feeling as if I can't show up in spaces and be my full self and feel confident in what I do and like, um, I do theater and I've been doing it since I was 16 and it will never not be a part of my life but all in the same I also uh, I'm always fighting with myself to show up in spaces with my light and with my best self and so I guess my question to you is even though like you said earlier it's a lifelong journey but like what are some of the things that you do that help you to combat that so that you can come into spaces and be as vulnerable and as profound as you've been today. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I mean, I think any sort of system or set of short-term challenges that just, you know, they say the way to start exercising is just challenge yourself to do one push-up or do one whatever. Like if I can just get myself to open the cold turkey writer program that only puts this blank page on my laptop screen and say, okay, I'm going to type out 100 words anything I can do to start the process. If I, can get, if I can get to the stage of the process where I have started filming myself and I'm editing, that, that, will, that creative work, it builds up a momentum of its own that'll sort of silence the inner critic and just try to, try to get myself in the zone and stay in the zone as often as I can and be patient with myself when I'm out of the zone. You know, know that there's always gonna be an ebb and flow. Um, and just try to use that downtime purposefully um, and replenish and be able to recognize a spark of an idea that I know I want to seize upon and try to seize upon it right away because it'll be much easier to get myself back in the groove if I jump on it right then instead of I'll go to sleep and do it in the morning. In the morning, I will have had a bunch of weird dreams and then I'll turn on Morning Joe and be vexed about something else and the idea won't be, <laughs> you, you, I, that's, something I'm still, that's something I'm trying to really focus on now is just freeing myself up to jump on an idea right away and have enough invested in it that I'm gonna try and see it to completion. Um, and just, yeah, I mean, I think, man, I'm so jealous of some of the younger people who have been up here uh, discussing their, their drive and their hunger to prove themselves and prove their haters wrong, um, which is something I think, you know, some people I think can sustain that throughout their lives. I mean, I always look back to Michael Jordan's Hall of Fame acceptance speech. I don't know if anyone, people have seen that, but it's just 
him letting you know that he has never let go of any grudge he's <laughs> ever had in his life. <laughs> it's not, there's no tear jerky sentimental stuff. It's all. So to my high school coach, how you like me now. <laughs> it's just, <laughs> so, it's, so I think it's probably possible to find ways to sustain that I'm going to keep showing you all. But for me, that, that just hasn't been my journey. Like I've sort of gotten to a place where I'm just really happy to be here and happy to find ways to contribute and build community around my work, um, which is f as fulfilling as ever when I'm in it, but I don't have that sort of, I gotta show, I gotta show everyone. That, that for me with age has dissipated more and more. So finding other ways to sort of nudge myself into the zone, as many ways as I can find to do that. Other questions? Um, one of the first things out of your mouth was learn to believe you should be seen and heard. And I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit more about <clears throat> the process of your emergence as an introvert and uh, also over the, you know, a couple decades how you've, how integrity has played a role in that process. Um, it's definitely a gradual process. Um, it's much easier to look back and see how I've become more comfortable with myself. Um, a process that weirdly is largely played out in public, thankfully in the more ephemeral form of radio than on Twitter where every, every lesson you learn is in the form of a public document. I'd hate to be one of these young people like Doja Cat right now, has to learn all these lessons <laughs> in this permanent public forum. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if there's any easy description. Um, being connected to that, that commitment of live radio, you know, you have to dive into the deep end of the pool and show up that, that like, having that system and structure and community that forces me to keep jumping in and having this really welcoming community, both at WBAI and in hip hop's community back at that time, um, just encouraged me to keep showing up and it gets, I think it gets easier and easier bit by bit, the more you do it. Um, what, was, what was the other part of the question? Um, we talked about the integrity, but like how uh, you've emerged as a public figure with right. your introverted self. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, I mean, it's, I think it's been a blessing that it's been a gradual process for me. You know, I definitely missed out on, or you could maybe say squandered a lot of opportunities in the early years. You know, I didn't, I only worked at the source for a fairly short time just because I was still young and just starting to unlearn all this self-sabotage and believe I deserved this stuff and it was just too many things to juggle at once. Um, so I think there's a lot of ways I could have been on a different path if I was ready to fully inhabit uh, all of these opportunities I was given at this early age, but I think going through a slow process of learning to be at peace with myself and believe I should assert myself and assert my vision and share it. I think that the blessing has been by the time I felt confident enough to really fully seize opportunities and put myself out there, I had 10 years of experience saying no to almost everything. Um, so it was sort of ingrained in me by default. Uh, not to say yes to whatever sounds the juiciest, regardless of uh, how it fits into making a body of work. I had sort of, I had been restricted to building something that is low key but has integrity for long enough that it just became the tradition I was accustomed to by the time I had opportunities to choose otherwise. Um, and I think um, I'm glad that it worked out that way because there's a reward, which is not monetary uh, necessarily, but when something happens, like I'm stepping away from my radio show, um, people will come around and support um, and amplify and try to help me find other opportunities because that sort of integrity builds interest in, in, in the, you know, it, there's equity in those other ways of people who appreciate 
you maintaining yourself on that level will recognize and that'll have a lasting value where people want to come around and support and work with you. Um, and it, it makes sure you make sure make sure I can sleep easy at night and make sure I'm going to have a space um, where people want to support. That's my long winded. Oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> I was like, are you giving me the time sign? <laughs> uh, if you had to wrap a song from front uh, from the start to finish, what song could you do? <laughs> <I'm> not, <laughs> you don't have to do it. If you're trying to get me you, to do it, you can just, <laughs> that's you not can just claim it. We're short on time. <laughs> Rap a, oh, thank God. Uh, I don't, that would be so hard to choose. <laughs> I could, I could, that, my name's on the back of the first Wu Tang album. We, we um, I, I mean, I'm going to say Run DMC, Sucker MCs, because that's the first, as a 10, 11 year old, that's the song that I was up on my bunk bed listening to and said, wow, this hip hop thing is really going to be something. So that's one, that's one that's deeply ingrained in the memory for sure. Nice. So I'm going to ask you one more question with not enough time to answer probably, which is, so just moving in as we move into the afternoon, we're heading towards that conversation on joy. What, what brings you joy or what does that mean in your life today? Because we talked about a lot of heavy stuff. Yeah. I don't, yeah, I mean, I'm looking for, right now I'm sort of trying to appreciate empty space and waiting to see what's going to fill it. Um, and not sort of filling it with junk. It's so funny that I talked about 25 browser windows in that video from 10 years ago. I think of that as a relatively new phenomenon. I mean, I'm definitely up to 50 or 75. But there are so many ways to fill space now. And I, just being out of town and being in a hotel room instead of my house, I notice how much more comfortable I am just sitting here, sitting there in silence, not having all these stimuli inviting me to veg out um, for the rest of the evening. Um, so I'm trying, in, in all the parts of my life where there are empty space, I'm trying to be patient and seeing what I want to fill it with mm -hmm. and hanging out with my cat in the meantime. I was just gonna say the cat has to fi figure into that someplace. The cat is so important. Yeah, my cat that was in the video passed away, unfortunately, Tika, um, a couple of years ago. Uh, there's been a lot of losses in my life in the last few years. Um, and her, her name was Tika, by the way, named after Prince's sister, Taika. Local. I didn't know how to pronounce how Tyka pronounced her name, so I named my cat. <laughs> but I have another another cat, Wallace. Um, it was a really great companion, and it, it uh, named after. That's there's a triple entendre oh, there. Oh, okay. Actually, okay. So all of my cats have had some sort of Prince reference going. My first cat, who passed young, unfortunately, was named Tricky, which you'll know under the Cherry Moon reference. Um, so this cat, Wallace, there's a few different things going on. Uh, my partner, June, who also passed away unexpectedly a few years ago, we had adopted a couple of cats named Bodhi um, and Kima, which is a reference to The Wire. Um, and then I brought the cat home on March 9th, which is Biggie Small's birthday. So those, there's a Wallace reference yes. that connects both of those together. And then Prince has a classic unreleased song named Wally, which allowed me to uh, continue that tradition as well. So the cat is named Wallace, very long-winded answer. And, and he's been adorable. a tremendous, tremendous gift. I mean, it's, well, there's, there's an arc of, for the first month, tremendously inspired again to keep showing up um, and be fully present for life. And then for the next, uh, hopefully 20 years after that, he's modeling never wanting to get out of bed. <laughs> so we're trying to find, <laughs> he, he makes uh, not getting the day started look very appealing. Um, so we're, try, we're still trying to find a balance with that, but he's been a great blessing. So before I ask you the last question, which is the same question we've been asking everybody, I, I want to make a plug too. So um, definitely go check out Jay's Ill Doctrine videos. Uh, there's a lot there. There's a lot to learn there. There's a lot. Uh, you, you can also check out Jay on our Giant Steps videos. You have a very touching um, <coughs> short video about Prince. And so if anybody in the room also has feelings about Prince like I do, that's worth checking out. And, and then another Giant Steps connection. Uh, you did uh, the Combat Jack show in 2017. I'm so, yeah, I feel so lucky to have uh, done an interview with Jack, uh, with Reggie, yeah. um, pretty shortly before he passed. Uh, which is a really wonderful conversation about my whole history and, and yeah, it's a great it's a great sh episode to check out. There were a few people I think who were here in 2015 when uh, Combat Jack was part of this this conversation. Who also we went like he was one of 
the first other hip hop bloggers that came out just a little bit after me. So we had been in community a long time. Well, and here's another community piece. I was on air with TK and Conscious when we got the word about oh, wow. him in December. And then I saw, we saw each other that night. So, which was for me, was really important to be with you guys that day because it was a tough, tough day. But, so lots of videos out there if you can read it or listen up, read up, watch up more about Jay. Yeah, so I'm going to start a podcast soon. Look out for that somewhere. Yes. <laughs> and, and if they follow you on Facebook, they can get some of your underground transmission radio. Oh, yeah. I, no, no, you said too much. Oh, sorry. <laughs> There Not is, so underground anymore. I have been doing secret broadcasts, if you know where to find them, since I've been doing the radio show. <laughs> I've probably been ruining surprises like that <laughs> no, my whole not, life. No, no, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Uh, okay, so what, what, what do you need, or yeah, what do you need from the people in this room or from the Giant Sips family overall? Well, I definitely want everyone here to vote in the midterms. Um, but other, other than that, I think uh, you just keep Keep showing up. Um, an important part of, try to say this quickly, an important part of the story of leaving the radio station that I left out is there just happened to be a reporter there who was doing a piece about me. Um, so she was there for the whole drama of me confronting management and then going on the air, having to speak about it. And it really uh, brought home to me how important it can be to have someone uh, bearing witness how powerful it can be for us to bear witness for each other. It's a, a big part of what community gives us is we can be there to be each other's conscience and hold each other true to our principles because I would love to say with absolute certainty that I would have made the same choices to confront management and condemn this on air and then leave if there hadn't be, been this reporter bearing witness and seeing whether I was true to my principles, but I can't say that with absolute certainty. It would have been possible for me to uh, take things more slowly, see what happens, see how many people notice. You know, there's a lot of ways I think it could have done. So it could have gone differently. So I really appreciated uh, having that reporter happen to be there and sort of be my witness, be my conscience, and make sure. Like I think it's doing the courageous thing is a lot more important than where the courage comes from. So the more we can be sure, show up for ourselves and for each other, I think is really important. Excellent. Thank you so much. That's really good.